thank you everyone for coming to this uh, penultimate majlis of of the of the term uh, i have already a christmas tree behind me which was just brought in uh, by by my family and uh, it's it's my greatest joy to to present you our guest uh, michael whom i met i think it was roughly, uh, a bit more than 2 years ago and we only met once and we only met briefly and the reason why he is here is that that we met at his talk in 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 berlin at the deutsche orientalische tag and his talk was brilliant uh, so i knew i wanted to to uh, to invite him and and this this happened now and uh, yeah you know that that it's also how how the the talk was crafted was was amazing for me because I think that somehow the best way of writing is that you read a text and then you have a question in your mind and then and the next sentence or next paragraph replies your to your to your question and and the, the talk uh, uh, flowed just this way so and and yeah it was it was an artwork in itself and then then when i asked michael whether he would present and he would come to this to the to the majlis which is obviously not not a conventional format and then he said yes yes i i i i, I will be happy to come and i will have some story to to tell so so well this is the time now and and i'm very grateful for for coming to us and and sharing your company with us please michael all right thank you i would like to begin by thanking Dr. Kristinegi and the um, Arab and Islamic Institute at the University of Exeter for inviting me to this majlis. And I would like to thank all of you, of course, for taking the time to listen to this talk. My academic career began in 2007 when I became the assistant professor of South Asian history at the University of Missouri. I would like to think that I was a successful professor my first Hindi of History of India course had 12 students, and the professors in my department were excited when this doubled to 25 students in my second year, amazed when I hit 50 students in my third year, and gobsmacked when I went over 70 students who enrolled in my course in my fourth year. In addition to teaching the entire 4,000 year history of India, I developed popular courses on the history of the Mongols, the Muslim world, comparative colonialism, and historiography. All of this, however, ended seven years later when my book manuscript, The Poetics of History, failed to find a publisher and I was denied tenure. At that time, I knew three professors who did not receive tenure. Two of them committed suicide. I did not understand at the time why losing tenure would drive people to take their life, but I found out. Losing tenure isn't just about losing a job, it's losing an identity. An identity forged through years of graduate school, realized as a professor, and then stripped away by a dean's committee. I may occasionally play the part of a professor, presenting a lecture or adjunct teaching at a college course, but it is largely a charade. I'm not in the majlis of scholars. I'm an outsider who is looking in. So instead, I created a new identity through family, a wife, stepchildren, and a newborn son, while keeping my academic career on life support. Academia was my drug of choice, and I wasn't ready to go cold turkey. I began working part-time at the University of Missouri in Kansas City in the library and lecturing part-time around universities at Kansas City. I developed a new network and I was actually on the verge of returning to academia in 2020 when the pandemic struck and my network collapsed. I couldn't be a professor but I still felt that I had something to offer to higher education. I switched to full-time employment at UMKC 
in the library, and I attempted to rebrand myself for a career in academic support and higher education administration. But it turns out I was too much of the professor and my job interviews went nowhere. I didn't advise students, I mentored them. I didn't tutor students, I taught them. I was in a low paying, dead end job with no path towards advancement. So when the US federal government offered me a position six months ago, I took it. I didn't leave academia, academia left me. And as often happens at the end of a relationship, I went through a period of loss until I moved on. On a good day, I get up at about 5 a.m. I write a thousand words in a couple of hours. I get my son on the bus. I work an eight hour day. And then I spend my evening with my family. I get the occasional uh, uh, lecture, to, occasional offer to give a lecture. And there's even a chance that I may end up teaching a graduate course next year. But instead of channeling my energies into course development and lectures, I'm writing my long overdue book, The Parrot and the Sultan, which examines the relationship between the Persian poet Amir Husro Delavi and the Delhi Sultan Alauddin Khelji. And that brings us to our talk today. But first, I realize that the Monday Majlis is a gathering of Arabic and Islamic scholars, but this will also be posted on YouTube, where it may catch the eye of the public intellectual, the undergraduate student, or even the South Asian scholar who does not read Persian. The text we are about to discuss is an important source for South Indian history. In order to make this talk accessible to others, I'm taking a page out of Sheldon Pollock's A Rasa Reader, and I will use English translations rather than Persian terms. Thus, the Hazan al Futu will be the treasury of victories. I may use a Persian word like Pasida for clarity, but I will provide the English translation of panegyric poetry. Now, with that said, Grab your cup of coffee, your chai, or your favorite single malt scotch, and let's turn the page to the past. Okay. There is little doubt that Amir Husro lived during a time of transformation. Depending on how you count them, he saw the reigns of eight to 11 sultans and witnessed the Delhi Sultanate change from one of many regional kingdoms to the preeminent power of the age. He is linked to two men, the Sufi Nizamuddin Aliya and the Sultan Alauddin Khalji. As a Sufi poet, similar to Hafez, Amir Khusro is remembered for his ghazal love poetry that is still performed by Kawali singers. As a court poet, he's remembered for historical Masnavi narrative poems and his only prose work, The Treasury of Victories. Amir Khusro's five historical narrative poems and The Treasury of Victories raise the question of whether Amir Khusro wrote history. And this question interested me a decade ago. In fact, it was the subject of my first unpublished manuscript. However, the question seems pointless now. It has been debated by numerous scholars and it comes down to a choice. If you are a postmodernist or a postcolonialist, then Amir Khusro is a historian. If you're an empiricist, then he is a poet. A more interesting question is how Amir Khusro wrote about the events of his day. And this eventually leads us to the treasury of victories. Amir Khusro began the treasury victories as the Delhi Sultanate concluded a decade of conquest in 1311. The army achieved its greatest victory, at least in terms of plunder, when it defeated the Pandya forces and dismantled the Hindu Golden Temple in southern India. Soldiers loaded captured elephants, a prize in their own right, with loot and began their march north.
Okay, and for some reason, I can't advance. I'm gonna stop. Huh, this has never happened to me before. Sorry, I'm gonna. Stop this. This is a lesson for, in its own right, about technology when you go on the job market. Okay. I'm screen sharing, but I have no way to go forward. If it is... If it it doesn't go this way, if you just go back to to the to to see the whole thing, and then then maybe it works. Um, let me. Okay. Anyway, anyway, anyway now we, I got we, we are we are all right waiting on. Yeah. Okay. Can you see that? That. Yeah, we can okay. see. And that can you can you switch? Yeah, I'll just this do it on the way. side. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, the Treasury of Victories contains four sections. Okay, so just to catch up again. So it's 1311, the army is just finished its last and greatest, at least in terms of loot. Uh, victory down in the south, it's returning home. Amir Husra is writing this Treasury of Victories in prose. The Treasury of Victories contains four sections on administrative and economic reforms, Accounts of the Delhi Sultanate victories over the Mongols, Delhi Sultanate victories in Western India, and Delhi Sultanate victories in Southern India. Each of these four sections contains a paragraph to a couple of pages describing a particular victory. A common criticism of this work is that it lacks chronology. This is correct if the work is read as a whole. But each section has chronological order, chronological order that is reset with the next section. So the work is a chronological, but the sections are. What stands out the most, however, is the unusual style of prose. The treasury of victories is often described as hypermetaphoric or bombastic, with metaphors spilling off the page. Muhammad Habib, who published the first foolish English translation in 1931, introduced his translation by writing, While Amir Khusro's poetry has all the beauties of excellent prose, his prose has all the artificiality of very bad verse. It is jejun, insipid, tasteless, and wearisome. Failing to realize that the true beauty of prose lies in its being simple, direct, and effective, he tries to surprise his readers with by a new trick at every turn, attacks them with words, the meaning of which he is not, not likely to know, or offers him metaphors and similes calculated to shock and disgust. Amir Khusro, for all of his artistic talents, never comprehended that a book of prose, like a volume of verse, should be a thing of beauty and joy. Now, this passage, written in a time before translators had to convince their publishers about marketability, Habib's description of the treasury victories as jejun, insipid, tasteless, and wearisome, hardly inspires the reader. Yet this condemnation has dominated our understanding of the text. Amir Khusro, however, did not invent this style of prose. Rather, he chose a style that Dick Davis, building on the work of Michael Roberts, has termed the jeweled style. The jeweled style dates back to the ancient Greeks who brought broke up long passages with jewels of wordplay, metaphor, and contrast. This prose style made its way eastward, where it influenced Persian works, works such as Fakhiruddin Gurgani's 11th century Wiz and Ramin, as well as Hassanin Nizami's 13th century Crown of Glorious Deej, the 
Taj al Masir, and Amir Khusro's 14th century treasury of victories. Let's look at an example from Hassani Nizami's Crown of Glorious Deeds. I am choosing this text because it was dedicated to a sultan, a Delhi sultan, nearly a century before the treasury of victories. Amir Khusro certainly read the text, which narrates Gurid and early Delhi Sultanate conquests. Describing the army's victory to Ajmer, Hassani Nizami wrote, the overcast skies with the lightning of swords rain down the warrior's blood. The emerald-like dagger squeezed the coral out of the enemy's jugular veins, and the azure-faced blades were stained with the ruby-colored wine. It was as if the water lilies had been flecked by red logwood water until the leaves were awash with tulip-colored drops, and its petals turned red like the Judas tree. The gaze of the mountain partridge focused on the parrot's wings, and the fire of the wounds, like the flash of the thunderbolt, burnt men and elephants. The battlefield was saturated by the rain of blood, and the sky was cleansed by the dust of battle. Now, if you are unfamiliar with accounts of medieval battles, the gore is probably the first thing that you notice. But what I would like to focus on is the jeweled style of this narrative. The jewels, of course, are the metaphors, and there are a lot of metaphors. Swords flashing like lightning as the blood is raining down, flowers turning red from the blood, armies like the partridge and the parrot, with men and elephants falling in a flash. Just as the battleground is saturated with blood, the passage is saturated with a mixture of metaphors. It works, however, because the metaphors serve the narrative. Amir Khusro's innovation is that he inverts this relationship, making the narrative serve the metaphor. Every paragraph in the Treasury of Victories is written according to an identified nisbet. A nisbet is a relationship or a connecting theme, although it may be easier to stick with Muhammad Wahid Mirza's translation as allusion. These allusions, despite being identified at the beginning of a passage, lead to the difficulty in reading the text. Take, for example, this passage on the defeat of the Mongols. Behold, an allusion to water flowing like a river. At the head of the Ali Wahan River, waves of Muslims arrived like the crashing of the sea. The accursed Kupek fell or drowned in the midst of these swift waters of the sword and began to tread water. The water of the sword passed over his head the believers, with mercy in their hearts, ran from right and left and captured him so that the waters of the sword did not pass over his head. Another army, led by that luckless Iqbal and untrusty Taibu, who were thirsty for Muslim blood and disgusted with their own blood, were following Kupek's army. Suddenly, a flood, a flood of the Sorry, suddenly a flood from the blood of the slain unbelievers crashed upon them, and it was as if the flood was familiar to them, of course. Each and every one of them dove into the flooded plains. They flailed about in that blood, crying out on account of speaking with the sharp waters of the sword when they realized that a great torrent of blood had overwhelmed them. Although they were struggling to gain a foothold in that swift flood of blood, it did not meet with success. A vanguard of the army of Islam arrived in the middle of it, their arrows like a cloud of rain falling upon their heads, their charge like the churning of the Jehun rivers and the soldiers fled from the arrows of rain, their hearts hanging in a downpour of arrows, and on every side there was an army like the wave of an ocean. 
Unlike Hassani Nizami or even Gurgani, who mix their metaphors, lightning, uh, water lilies, birds, and storms, to adorn their narrative, Amir Husro makes the narrative conform to a known and stated illusion. Some have lamented that these illusions are the product of a poet's mind rather than the observation of a historian's eye. The assertion that a plotment by illusion reflects the whims of a literary mind appears correct at first glance. However, after a decade of reading and reflecting about this text, things begin to appear differently. Amir Khusro did not choose illusions based on literary flair like Gurgani or Hassanei Nizami, but on historical fact. Out of the 13 illusions found in Amir Khusro's description of the Mongols, half are allusions to war, while the other half are allusions to movement, comparing the battle and the army's movement to chess, backgammon, spring and autumn, the dust blowing from Bihar to Bhutan, and especially water. Considering that the Mongol campaigns involved horse warfare on the open plains, illusions stressing movement were particularly apt in describing Mongol battles. Amir Khusro used a different set of illusions for the conquest of the Hindus. The most quoted passage of the Treasury of Victories takes place after the Sultanate army has raided and conquered the Somnath Temple in Gujarat. Behold, an allusion to Kaaba and Khalil. Then they caused that so not idol house to touch its forehead to the ground in worship toward the exalted Kaaba. When the idol house was reflected in the sea, it was as if the temple had washed and then prayed. Since the Hindus had become householders midway along the road to the house of Abraham and robbers of those who were lost, they were reformed by Abraham's custom of breaking idols. But his single idol, a grand idol and the largest of the forbidden ones, was sent to the royal court in order that the broken, powerless god might create despair for the idol-worshipping Hindus, and that they might see their broken, impotent gods. For then they might return saying that the tongue of the Shah's sword presented a clear explanation on this verse of the Quran. He broke them into pieces, except this big one, so that they may return to it. In that way, the region of the infidel, which was the Qibla of the fire worshippers, became the Medina of Islam, and those who were religious leaders in the Brahmin way of life became religious leaders in Abraham's way of life. Wherever the strongly orthodox saw the, uh, an idol or an idol house, they broke it with all of their might. Written according to the illusion of Kaaba and Abraham, the conquered Hindu temple jumps into the sea, performs its ablution before bowing and praying towards Mecca. I think that it's necessary to pause a moment to gain an appreciation of the Somnath temple. The historic Somnath temple doesn't exist to this to the, today but it was built in an architectural style found in southern Rajasthan and Gujarat, as seen in the Vimala Vasahi temple. These are extremely ornate temples in which every surface may be carved with figures, fauna, and ornamentation. Now, what does it mean for a temple to be converted? We can see this in the Somnath temple which was transformed back into a Hindu temple, only to be during Amir Khusro's time. It was conquered and transformed into a Muslim temple during Amir Khusro's time, transformed back into a Hindu temple, only to be converted again at the end of the century. Returning to the above passage, scholars have rightly noted that this is just not the conquest of a Hindu temple, but the Hindu temple's conversion literally, in, or in literature, as well as even physically. It's a conversion to Islam portrayed by its praying to Mecca. I contend, however, that the passage has another meaning that only appears when reading the illusions instead of the history. 
Take, for example, Amir Khusro's description about the building of the Delhi ramparts. The de walls surrounding Delhi fell into disrepair, which led the Mongols to besiege and occupy Delhi in 1302 or 03. This forced Delhi, the Delhi Sultan, Alauddin Khalji, to rebuild the walls. And here is Amir Khusro's description. An illusion that is about building buildings and ramparts. The rampart of Delhi, which is second to the sacred Kaaba, showed the passage, the passing of the ages on its buildings, and it was even worn worse from the continual rotation of the nine glass spheres than the wine houses of that regal time. Terribly intoxicated, it neither appeared nor acted dignified from one establishment to the next, although it looked powerful. Sometimes it placed its face on the dirty road before the mean ones and bent toward the moat's low place in greetings. Its turret, which was once so high that its turban fell to the ground when one looked up at it, dropped its cap onto the ground because of its humiliating condition. Thus it was time for a country founded upon a powerful ruler may it last as long as the foundation of the world. Like the Somnath Temple, this passage opens with a comparison to the Kaaba. The Somnath Temple bowed in prayer towards the Kaaba, while the Delhi walls bow or tip over due to their drunken and dilapidated state. The tower is transformed after its reconstruction. As Amir Khusro describes in a later passage, here is an illusion that is once again about buildings. He ordered those gold nuggets, dust, and bricks withdrawn from that teeming treasury and placed that sum in the building until the skilled mason, work be mason began to work and hand by hand, they constructed another deputy rampart. The forearm of its tower brushed the finger while the tower held the dyed hand of the Pleiades. Its rampart rubbed beneath the armpit of the vigorous Mars, and its high stature made the turquoise sky into a turquoise belt. It is a requirement to offer blood to a new building, so a thousand goat-beard Mongols sacrificed their hearts. Sorry, heads. <clears throat> Once rebuilt, the Delhi rampart extends into the heavens, almost reaching Mars, holding the hand of the Pleiades and wearing the sky as a belt. There are times when Amir Khusro applies the same illusions to a different end. Take, for example, the Delhi Sultanate's conquest of the Golden Temple. Not, again, the Golden Temple of the Sikhs, but the Golden Temple of the Hindus in southern India. Behold an allusion to Kaaba and the Idol House. In summary, that golden idol house, which was the temple of Mecca to the Hindus, they dismantled with complete respect, saying that takbir, Allahu Akbar, they cracked the foundation of infidelity. Because of the takbir's call, the spiritual birds hovering above came down from the air like pigeons. The sound of the chisel increased so much that the wall's ears opened up. The Sufi-like dancing sword intoxicatingly engaged the golden robe of the temple to such an extent that the heads of the Brahmins and idolaters danced from the neck to the feet. Amir Khusro generally described Hindu temples with allusions to the Kaaba. Abraham, or idolatry, as seen in this passage and the one on the Soma temple. While the Soma temple performs its ablutions and converted, the Muslim army dismantled the Golden Temple. The destruction was so thorough that scholars debate its location to this day. What is surprising about all this is that the illusions are not random. <laughs> Amir Khusro does not use the metaphors in the jeweled style as ornamentation like Gurgani or yeah, Gurgani or Hassani Nizami, rather. The historical event determines the illusion that is used. The ebb and flow of horse warfare led to illusions such as chess, backgammon, waves and floods that emphasized the movement of cavalry. 
The illusions changed when he knew forts that involved siege warfare. Forts extend into the heavens that are rivaled only by the Sultanate's own standards and towers. The Somnath Temple was converted, the Golden Temple destroyed, while the Warangal Temples or the Warangal Fort's walls, which I have not mentioned because I don't want to get too confusing, bowed or fell to the Muslim army as the Hindu temple in Warangal remained intact. In each case, it was the history of these battles that determined the illusions. Finally, the treasury of victories is often read as a polemical account of Muslim conquest and Hindu resistance. However, reading the illusions instead of the conquest changes this polemic. Illusions apply to Mongols, Hindus, and Muslims in equal measure. The Somnath Temple and the Delhi Rampart both strayed from the straight path and re were rebuilt in grandeur. The Mongol horse campaigns are fluid, but so is the Muslim army that overwhelms the river in battle. And later in the text, when the Muslim army rides towards southern India, it moves like the wind, just as the Mongols did. And that, switch to this. Okay. <clears throat> Fine, you may say. These Nisbet illusions are interesting, but what does it tell us about the history of the period? What does it tell us about Amir Khusro or even Sultan Alauddin? The answer is a surprising amount. While the Treasury of Victories is described as Amir Khusro praising Alauddin's reign, it is about battles more than panegyric. Persian authors such as Zioddin Barani or Isami, and Indic authors such as Naya Chandra Suri or Padmanabha inserted imagined conversations into their works. Amir Khusro could have done the same thing based on his years of serving the royal court. Instead, he confines himself to the reforms and battles of the Sultanate army and its leaders. The use of this jewel style means that the reader must have foreknowledge of the events in order to appreciate or even understand Amir Khusro's narrative. The text would have circulated among those who knew the details of the battles. This includes Sultan Alauddin, who participated in sieges, heard stories of warfare, and war read war reports. Amir Khusro praised Alauddin at times, but the heroes of the story are the governors and generals who led the battles. For a poet who wrote Qasida, panegyric in the court, Amir Khusro spent a remarkable amount of time focusing on people other than Alauddin. And this leads us back to the relationship of Amir Khusro and Sultan Alauddin. Now, just as we need to have foreknowledge of battles in order to understand the treasury of victories, we also need to know about Amir Khusro in order to understand his relationship with Sultan Alauddin. Alauddin rose to power by assassinating his uncle, the reigning Sultan Jalaluddin Khalji. Sultan Jalaluddin gave Amir Khusro his first position in the royal court and the aging sultan reminded Amir Khusro of the maternal grandfather who raised him from a little boy. Alauddin's murder of Jalaluddin, the execution of his sons and Jalali noblemen, soured Amir Khusro on Alauddin's reign. Instead of writing a long Masnavi narrative poem, as he had for the other sultans, Amir Khusro compiled his third collection of poetry, and then remade Nizami Ganjavi's Kamsa. Over the next 10 years, from 1301 to 1311, the same years when the Delhi Sultanate conquered most of the subcontinent, Amir Khusro immersed himself in the teachings of the Sufi Nizamuddin Aliya and wrote Khasida Panegyric for the royal court. Alauddin had laudable achievements with his siege and victory at Rantambor in 1301 and Chittor in 1303, 
not to mention the Sultanate victories over the Mongols. And if you are familiar with Amir Khusrau, he rarely passed on the opportunity to disparage the Mongols. Yet despite these achievements, Amir Khusrau still refused to write a Masnavi narrative poem like the key to victories, the Mifta ul Futu, composed for Alauddin's murdered uncle. Now my students, and I had students, often asked me, didn't Alauddin notice that Amir Khusra wasn't praising him like he did with the previous sultans? Of course he did. But Alauddin was no fool. A gem may be exquisite, even if it doesn't shine brightly. Alauddin retained, but did not reward Amir Khusro. We know this from Amir Khusro's plea to the Sultan in a short Masnavi narrative poem contained in the remainder of the exquisite, exquisite the Bakia Ye Nakia, Amir Khusro's fourth collection of poetry, which coincides with Alauddin's reign. In this poem, Amir Khusro begged the Sultan for more support during a time of financial struggle. We do not know the exact date, but it seems likely that it was during the poet's 10-year dry spell. Zia Udin Barani also commented on Alauddin's failure to amply reward a poet of Amir Khusro's stature in his History of Furo Shahi. So, Amir Khusro detests Sultan Alauddin. He refuses to write a Masnavi narrative poem for the Sultan like he did or will do for four other Sultans. Instead, he assembles his third collection of poetry. He reworks the Kamsa, and then he spends the next decade writing Kasida panegyric for the royal court, where he's just phoning it in. Or for the younger generation, he's ghosting the Sultan. The treasury victory... Oh, okay. So he's ghosting the Sultan. The Sultan, of course, realizes this and lessens his patronage. Amir Khusro needs to get back into the Sultan's grace, but still detest him. The question is, how do you celebrate Sultanate victories without glorifying the Sultan? The treasury of victories was Amir Khusro's answer. Alyssa Gabay has noted how Amir Khusro was a master of wordplay, Yiham. The treasury of victories, as we have seen, pushes wordplay to its limit. The text may appear to praise Alauddin, however, it focuses on the battles rather than the Sultan directing the victories. There is a long tradition in Persian literatures of poets offering veiled, or even not so veiled, critiques of their patrons. Olga Davidson, who spoke to this Majlis a couple of weeks ago, has written about Ferdowsi's criticism of Mahmoud Ghaznavi in the Shah Nama. Amir Khusro illustrates Davidson's point, perhaps a little better, in his Masnavi narrative poem, Duwal Rani and Khizr Khan, where he criticizes the Sultan in order to educate the prince. Yet, I would argue that the treasury victories also qualifies. The text structure appears to praise the Sultan when it really celebrates the army. So to conclude, I've engaged in an alternate reading of the treasury of victories. Scholars have plundered this treasury for information on economic reforms and battles. However, the nisbet allusions and metaphors are the true jewels in this treasury. I have read these metaphors with some interesting results. While the treasury of victories was unquestionably about sultanate victories in battle, it was not about the opposition of Muslim conquest and Hindu resistance. Allusions apply to Muslims, Hindus, and Mongols in equal measure. Unlike the eulogies of love poetry that were composed and recited for the public, Amir Khusro wrote the treasury of victories as for a specific audience dedicated to Sultan Alauddin, but glorifying the governors, generals, and the army who fought and won these battles, Amir Khusro finally realized how to offer faint praise, and the treasury victories marks a turning point in Amir Khusro's life. 
In the previous decade, from the completion of the Hamsa in 1301 or two, to the writing of the Treasury of Victories in 1311, Amir Khusro did not write any long works for the court. Over the next decade, from 1311 to 1321, he would compose three long Masnavi narrative poems for the court and compile two more collections of poetry. I would argue that Amir Khusro applies this feint of praise in these later works as well. But that is a talk for another time. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. <clears throat> I was wondering whether to, sorry, <clears throat> whether to label it, <clears throat> sorry, no, no, no. <clears throat> whether to label it as a gem or to label it rather uh, a royal, uh, royal headgear or something like gear, um, because it's, it's, um, <clears throat> your talk itself is, is, is it's really an artwork, as I as I promised it would be, and I I knew what I was I was talking about, wasn't? So so thank you, thank you very much again, and um, and again it's it's not, yeah, it, it is it is immensely interesting, and also these these links on how to how to to serve. I'm, I'm very very interested in this topic of of. Uh, being in the patronage of someone we dislike uh that's not a unique unique situation for for uh, Amiri Hos Hosro it's it's i think a very general hu human or artistic condition and 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 your stu uh, your study uh, shed shed light uh, to it from yeah it's beautiful thank you um i will i will um close the recording and um, invite invite questions. I see already we have one. But before I, I do it, I nearly forgot the, to to advertise the next majlis, which will be uh, this one. Um, just a second. I put it into the chat. So <clears throat> next Monday. So it will be Ferenc Chirkes on tur Turkic martyrologies in Safavid Iran. So there is there is actually a nice link with this this talk, um, and and it will be also very very interesting. So I I hope you can you can already register for it if you haven't done done so. Okay, I'm closing uh, the recording and opening the floor for for questions. <clears throat>